Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, as usual to you all for these uh, new tax talks uh, that we're happy uh, to host uh, today. Uh, we hope that you are all well in spite of the lasting circumstances. Hopefully spring, at least in the north, uh, is almost here and that gives us some hope. And you will see that these tax talks will be uh, under uh, the heading of, of hope, I think, on many fronts. Um, let me introduce to you the team which will be speaking to you with the next slide, please. Um, uh, so sorry, we have the housekeeping, but I think uh, that Hazel has told you, unless Hazel wants to come in on the housekeeping. No, I'll pop in. Thanks, Pascal. Um, if we can just go back, I just want to cover some light housekeeping before we get started, in particular for those who might be new to the OECD tax talks. Um, for security reasons, the chat function is disabled for Zoom attendees. However, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. These questions will be moderated and we will do our best to address them in the dedicated Q&A session at the end. As usual, this webinar is being recorded and all of those registered will be notified by email when the replay is available. And last but not least, for those active on social media, you can use the hashtag OECD Tax Talks. Back to you, Pascal. Thank you so much, Hazel. So we can move on and talk about the speakers. I think you know them all, uh, but very quickly. Grace Perez Navarro, the Deputy Director, David Bradbury, uh, who is the head of the Tax Policy and Statistics uh, Division. You have Arim Pross, our German engineer. We have Sophie Chatel, uh, notre spécialiste des traités fiscaux en français dans le texte, Stuart Brandt, uh, uh, who is the head of the transfer pricing unit, uh, a Californian surfer in another life, and Sarah Perret, uh, who is one of our star economists uh, and who will talk about some very interesting work that uh, she's doing uh, under the supervision of David. If we can move uh, quickly to the uh, topics we'll uh, go through today. Update on the G20. You know that there was a G20 meeting uh, last Friday and uh, there is some significant progress, I think, to a report from this uh, meeting. Uh, we'll uh, do an update uh, on pillar one, pillar two of the uh, project on the digitalization of the economy and the tax challenges. Uh, we'll move to the tax policy section uh, with uh, uh, an update on what we're doing. And you will see that this is an area of work which I think will grow in the future, uh, in particular under the heading of building back better, building back better tax uh, administrations, tax policies uh, is something which uh, I think will be a priority uh, in many countries uh, in the world. Uh, we'll update you on our response to the COVID-19 crisis, both on tax treaties and transfer pricing. Since our last tax talks, there has been some uh, news uh, there. And uh, finally, a very important report was issued recently. Uh, Grace uh, was the head of uh, this work, uh, and she will report on uh, the work on, on tax and crime and uh, professional uh, enablers. And, and finally, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go quickly through uh, what's, what's next on the, on the agenda. But let's start with the update on the G20 and immediately to the um, uh, highlight. Uh, there was no communique uh, of the Italian presidency of the G20. Uh, it is sometimes the case uh, for the first meetings and it has been uh, the case uh, more often since we uh, started uh, virtual meetings. Uh, but the press release uh, issued by uh, the Italian presidency uh, is interesting uh, on all fronts, but also on the international taxation uh, front. So I let you read this paragraph unless you haven't um, uh, read it already, but uh, the finance minister and central bank governor meeting focused on the urgent need to reform the current system to respond to the new challenges posed by the globalization and the digitalization of the economy. And that's where the important message is. 
uh, in this regard, the G20 will endeavor to achieve a global consensus-based solution by mid-2021. I can hear some asking, where is the news? Because it's true that since October, it was agreed that the deadline would be pushed to mid-21. But here, with a new setting, with in particular a new US administration, there is the confirmation that the deadline uh, by mid-21 uh, remains the same. If we move on uh, to a more granular uh, uh, description of the environment, uh, and it's very US-centric, as you can see uh, from this slide, uh, we had on Thursday uh, last, one week ago, a letter sent by Secretary Yellen to her colleagues uh, which uh, I think is, is, is a very interesting uh, letter, uh, extremely nice, uh, extremely uh, multilateral um, uh, centered. Uh, and um, uh, Madame Yellen in that letter recognized the importance of concluding this negotiation on both pillars, pillar one and pillar two, which is an official clarification of the US position of the new administration. We had some hints after the hearings of Madame Yellen in the, in the Senate for her confirmation as Secretary for Treasury, but uh, there it's written uh, to, uh, it's sent to her colleagues from the G20. What was not written but said, and this was reported by the press and was a headline, uh, it was the fact that uh, in her speech uh, at the G20, uh, Secretary Yellen uh, announced that the US uh, was uh, withdrawing the proposal of a so-called safe harbor. I would put so-called in front of safe harbor uh, because it was not really a safe harbor, but more making uh, the uh, global based solution, if any, uh, an optional one for companies, which was the way the, the US addressed or didn't address the uh, scoping debate, uh, which had been at the core of the negotiation for the past uh, three years. So overall, uh, agreement, uh, as we've just said, to reach consensus by mid-21. Uh, what does that mean in terms of calendar? Well, uh, we have a G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting on the uh, 9th and 10th of uh, July. We think that this corresponds to mid-year and therefore our goal uh, would be to have an inclusive framework at the uh, very end of June, first week of July, where we could reach a global agreement much beyond the G20 because we have 139 members on an equal footing of the inclusive framework, but see if there is an agreement there which could be reported and then validated uh, by the uh, G20. So that's uh, that's uh, the goal. In between, there is a finance minister and central bank governors meeting on the 7th of April. Uh, it's almost tomorrow in one month time, but maybe some progress in the negotiation will be reported uh, by then. And, and Arim will uh, update you on the state of play of the negotiation. Uh, next slide will uh, drive us uh, to other tax topics uh, in uh, the on the G20 agenda, and I would like to put the focus on uh, tax and environment in particular. You know that the uh, climate change uh, uh, mitigation uh, uh, is one of the priorities, if not the priority, of uh, almost all countries in the world. And to uh, mitigate climate change, uh, there are many instruments. There is a wide range of instruments. But one of them is pricing carbon. Carbon has a negative externality which is about global warming uh, and uh, carbon today is not priced or, or is priced uh, much below what it should. The, the OECD is engaged in that work. We're not the only ones. The IMF is doing tremendous work there. The World Bank is engaged, the UN as well, of course, with uh, the COP uh, conference. So many international organizations are putting their uh, brain power uh, to the uh, member states uh, to, to help move on that front. It is true that the G20 
did not really talk about that. At the beginning, the G20 had some objectives on fossil fuel subsidies. If you look at the first G20 communiques 2010, 2011, and then these, these more or less disappeared. The Italian presidency, and it's due to the urgency of the topic, it's due to the orientation of the new US administration. The Italian presidency decided to put this issue of climate change uh, on the top of the agenda and to include in the finance track many aspects of that and in particular the uh, sustainable uh, finance study group uh, which has been renamed and renewed which will be co-chaired by the us and china will deal with taxonomies with esg uh, but also with tax policy and there will be a, a an own track on uh, carbon pricing uh, that's what you can see in the language uh, which was included in the press release of the g20 presidency and in particular and we would like to thank the italian presidency for their trust uh, they have asked us to to co-organize with them and, and with the IMF. Uh, the uh, tax symposium, you know that now traditionally there is, there has been a tax symposium. Uh, and this year, the tax symposium, which will be on the 8th of July, will be dedicated to uh, tax uh, and um, environment, and in particular, carbon pricing. There will be then the G20 finance ministers meeting, which may decide on, on the level of ambition that the G20 finance ministers could have there in terms of deciding on the trajectory, in terms of deciding on, on some objective per country, some peer review, some whatever to be discussed. And there will be uh, an event uh, under the uh, um, uh, supervision of the IMF on the 11th of July, just after the finance ministers meeting, which will be a climate summit, where this topic will also uh, build up. So you can see here something which is a new stream, which is very important stream which I think in the future will grow. Finally, uh, on the other key deliverables for the Italian presidency, I mentioned a report, I mean, I, I mentioned the work on, on carbon pricing. We'll do with the IMF a report by uh, April to inform the G20 and help them calibrate the level of ambition. We uh, will uh, do an update of the report on tax policy at the time of COVID, uh, which we delivered in April last year for the uh, Saudi presidency. So there will be an update and uh, we'll do a new report uh, in October. Uh, we will uh, also update the database uh, of the tax policy responses to the crisis. We will update the common reporting standard uh, to include uh, crypto assets. We will update the BEPS minimum standards uh, and, and all that will make the G20 presidency under the uh, under the it Italy uh, a very active presidency, not to mention the fact that five years after the establishment of the BEPS inclusive framework, it's time to see how developing countries uh, benefit uh, from the membership of the inclusive framework and how we could do better on that front. The secretary definitely uh, will try to inform the G20 and see whether some recommendations can be made. Um, I think with that, uh, uh, I stop and I will turn to uh, Arim for him to brief you on the update on the tax and the digitalization of the economy. Arim, over to you. Thank you, Pascal. I'll take you through the two pillars, different colors, different pillars, all in five minutes. Um, so this is a summary and you've seen it. And in fact, it's playing it back to you. The key outcomes from the public consultation. <clears throat> starting with pillar one, um, not surprising, a couple of key messages that you see there, strong support for an international consensus solution, the removal of unilateral measures, strong support for a net basis taxation solution that avoids double taxation, not gross taxes, those we'll have already. So that is what brings us together. So I think there is a strong sense in all parts of whether it's business, civil society, whether it's different countries around the globe, that we do come together and find that solution that we have all agreed would be based on, on net and would avoid double taxation as we move forward. There's some questions around the policy objectives and principles, and that's reflected in the fact that we're still uh, trying to define exactly what the scope is, the big scope question. I'll get to that in a minute. I think positively there is convergence if we look a bit under the hood around many of these technical design features where you know, the approach to the base, the approach to losses, we see that there is some convergence on, on key technical aspects. 
there is a call for greater simplification and we're calling ourselves uh, for greater simplification. We're doing more than just calling for it. We're trying to simplify all parts of this whole engine of uh, pillar one. And that's clearly coming from business, more importantly or equally importantly from developing countries, I think also from tax administrations. So there isn't anybody uh, that is against simplification and there's a very, very big coalition for uh, simplification, noting, however, that simplification isn't obje objective in itself. And of course, we still need to have accuracy and we need to have the right tax policy outcomes that we're intending. There's some concerns about the level playing field and that balances also uh, the room for simplification and then hard to just say, of course, NGOs or at least a number of NGOs consider that the reforms are too narrow and also limit uh, the uh, or reject the limitation of amount A to residual profit. So that's a bit the picture that we have from the public consultation. If we move to the next one, then where are we <clears throat> on pillar one? And we've broken this down on key issues, which always has some degree of subjectivity, of course, if ever you do it, what is a key issue, what's not, and then what's a political issue and what's a technical issue. But broadly speaking here, um, there is the question of scope. I already mentioned the key issue, the question of scope and linked to it also questions on thresholds. There is then further down the question on the nexus. Do we have plus factors, not plus factors? The public consultation was not very enthusiastic on the presence of uh, plus factors. How do we define that? Also, what's the threshold? The question of quantum, how much? How do we deal with losses? Um, withholding taxes, the marketing and distribution safe harbor, they got a lot of support in the public consultation functionally with questions about how you would design it, that the principle is there, I think very much supported. What are the principles on elimination? Um, the tax certainty beyond amount A, how far does it reach? <clears throat> Unilateral measures and how do we define them? And then the role and function of amount B, apart from the technical work of then implementing whatever is decided based on its role and function. Then moving into technical issues, simplification, I mentioned, we are trying to simplify as much as we can. We're removing every building block, looking at and seeing whether we can engineer it in a simpler fashion. We're looking at things that we can do in the revenue sourcing space to recognize business models as they exist in order to minimize the need to recreate systems that may not exist for commercial purposes, but still have a high level of accuracy. Tax base segmentation and key questions we've heard. We're trying to simplify the framework, limiting the circumstances where we need segmentation, be able to allow on, to rely on what actually already exists, work through issues of double counting and the details of elimination as we integrate the amount A system into the existing system and eliminate double taxation. The specific design of the tax certainty process question also importantly on tax administration and implementation so that while we'll design it from the front, we'll also design it from the back because the tax administration will be the first thing that taxpayers will actually see. So we're working on many of these issues. I don't call them necessarily open issues on the technical side, so there's ongoing work on these technical issues. And of course, we've had discussions also on the political issues and, and they will need to be decided um, um, between now and when we come to July. If I then turn in the remaining two minutes and try to do the same on uh, pillar two, again, key messages from the public consultation running through here. I think there is a broadly stable and broad support for the basic design of the ETR calculation. Very pleased with that. I think there's also support for mechanism to address timing differences with a renewed call for reconsidering the use of deferred tax accounting. So we're taking this away. We're reflecting on this in the working parties as we speak. There is strong support for the development of simplification options. And ideally, uh, people are reminding us that the rule should be simple, so we wouldn't even need to simplify it, but that they need to be integrated with the rule application. And we've heard that message. I think at least in the business community, there was a strong support for rule order. There's also voices in the civil society that have preference for another rule order. Um, so, so we take this away and, and work these issues further as we move forward. There's concern around complexity and application of the split ownership rules and UTPR. And much like in pillar one, we're also trying to simplify here wherever we can, whether it's the split ownership or it's the UTPR, where can we reduce complexity while still maintaining the policy objectives that we're seeking to achieve. Um, there's concerns around the design of the STR and, and the questions of its scope. But of course, that's just the output from the public consultation. Civil society developing countries feel very strongly about this being part of the old package. So we're moving forward, including also with further reflections on the STR. Um, and, and finally, there's also support for measures to improve tax certainty, um, not just in the pillar one space, but also in the pillar two space. 
So if we then go to the same slide that we had for pillar one and pillar two here, key issues, political issues, of course, the rate, a minimum tax needs a rate. Um, consensus on the approach to blending carve outs, the percentages, the markup percentages, the detailed design here, the rule order and the status, um, mechanisms on the timing and implementation of the rule, how and when and phasing, the guilty coexistence questions, and the scope and status of all of this, including also the subject to tax rule. On the technical issues that we're working through in the working parties, not for the first time, but just list a couple of them, excluded entity definitions, certain funds, reads others, what do we do in the fund space? We got a number of interventions from the industry and we're reflecting on their um, appropriate um, delineation and how we implement some of this, recognizing that we do not want to introduce a, a layer of taxation where we've all collectively decided that we want to not do that with um, collective investment vehicles and funds vehicles um, otherwise. Then mechanisms to address the timing differences. I guess we've already mentioned that. Transitional rules, accelerated depreciation, points raised by the insurance and other industries reflecting on that. Um, the mechanics of implementing jurisdictional blendings, so you see taxes, attribution of those, how we deal with tax transparent entities. That could also help us with some of the funds. Treatment of reorganizations. And then finally, simplification options. I think that cut across the whole pillar and in particular around the split ownership rule and the under tax payment rule. Those are, I guess, a high level summary of you know, where we are on the pillars, on the more political side and the technical side. And I think with that, I hand it over to the next speaker. And I think that's David. Thanks very much, Akim. And it's great to be able to join you all for uh, a few moments to discuss tax policy with my colleague, Sarah Perrat. If we just turn to the next slide, uh, as Pascal mentioned earlier, many of you would recall that in April last year, uh, we issued a report, we delivered it for the G20 presidency of Saudi Arabia on tax and fiscal policy responses to the coronavirus. Now that uh, piece of work was focused very much on the emergency response measures that governments were implementing uh, at the, the onset of the crisis. Now, we've been asked to come back and provide an update by the Italian presidency, and we will do so in April. And obviously, the, the crisis is still with us. It's progressed through various phases, and this will give us an opportunity to not only take stock of the new policy measures that we've seen countries implement, but to also begin to share some insights on um, the direction that we believe countries could consider as they think about uh, not only pursuing a recovery out the back end of this crisis, but also uh, more importantly, to reflect upon the longer term um, tax system and its needs. And uh, indeed, we have launched or are undertaking a new project uh, that we describe as tax systems for inclusive and sustainable growth in the post-crisis world. And this is about not just thinking about the, the revenue uh, repercussions uh, that flow from the crisis and the direct and immediate implications. But we also see the crisis as being an opportunity to give us a, a moment to reflect upon whether or not our tax policy settings are fit for purpose uh, for the challenges that our economies face into the future. And so this will be an important piece of work that we'll be carrying out over the next couple of years. Uh, and there are many dimensions to that work and we'll share some thoughts on just two of those areas today, uh, on tax and the environment, but also on capital taxation. And as we move to the, the next slide, um, I want to say just a few things about the work we've been doing on tax and environment. And uh, as Pascal mentioned, there has been growing levels of interest in this work, particularly amongst the, the G20 finance ministers. And we welcome that because we really do see the ambitious commitments that were made at the Paris Agreement, uh, the uh, commitments to achieve net zero emissions by the middle of the century by so many economies, uh, that um, being able to decarbonise our economies is, is, is not just an environmental issue. This is something that goes to the heart of economic policy decision making. And that's why we're, we're really pleased to see finance ministers taking this on board as uh, a key area of focus. Now, for those of you that have been following our work, you would be very familiar with some of our flagship publications, Taxing Energy Use and Effective Carbon Rates in particular. Taxing Energy Use, which 
really does map across countries uh, the extent to which they are deploying uh, energy taxes um, right across uh, the various sectors. Uh, and it, uh, it is something we've been doing for a number of years. Well, you would have also realised and noticed that in January we released uh, an update, an expansion of that work, uh, Taxing Energy Use for Sustainable Development, where we extended it to 15 developing and emerging economies. And we intend to continue to expand this work, but importantly, this work also took into account fossil fuel subsidies in helping us to, to track carbon prices across these countries. And in March, we will deliver the next edition of Effective Carbon Rates, which uh, covers 44 OECD and G20 countries. And not only does it take into account uh, excise taxes and carbon taxes, but also emissions trading schemes in order to uh, take note of the levels of carbon pricing across these countries. Uh, this is really important. As Pascal said earlier, carbon pricing is not the only policy, policy instrument, but it's going to be an important one. Uh, and taking stock of how countries are progressing is something uh, that we've been doing and we will continue to do in that publication. And uh, with the increased interest at the G20 level, uh, we will be delivering that joint report with the IMF for April. And we look forward to being able to feed into the work of the G20 finance ministers as they approach the high-level tax symposium in July. Uh, now I'll hand over to Sarah Perre, who will take us through some of the work that we're doing on capital taxation at the individual level. Um, thank you, David, and, and hello, everyone. So personal capital taxation um, is an area where there's been growing interest, both um, at the OECD and outside of the OECD. And I should probably specify uh, before I start that when we talk about personal capital taxation, we're talking about taxes on personal capital income, so taxes on dividends, on interest, and on capital, on capital gains at the individual level, and taxes on personal assets. Um, and there are different reasons why there's been growing interest in that area. Uh, one is, of course, growing concerns over inequalities, which have been exacerbated by, by the current crisis. Um, another reason is that countries will probably uh, start to look for additional sources of tax revenue post-crisis and personal capital taxation is an option. And I think a, a third point on, on the more practical level is that we view um, the progress that's been made on international tax transparency as an opportunity to revisit personal capital taxation. So as you can see on this slide, this is a summary of our work in the area. Uh, in 2018, we released two reports, one on the taxation of uh, household savings, which provides a detailed review of the taxation of savings um, in OECD countries and in a few key partner economies, and another report on the role in the design of net wealth taxes in the OECD, which assesses um, the case for and against wealth taxes, but also looks at the practical experiences of OECD countries with uh, wealth taxation. We've also been uh, working on a comprehensive report on inheritance taxation that's going to come out in May, and I have a bit more information on that um, on the next slide. Um, we will be releasing a working paper on the effective taxation of housing uh, in June. And then finally, we will be embarking on a, a significant project on the taxation of personal capital income. Um, among other things, the project is going to look into effective tax rates on capital income, but also at arbitrage opportunities, and the idea is to come up with new policy recommendations in that area and um, regarding the taxation of top income earners more generally. So next slide, please. Um, so this is a slide, it's just a little preview of the upcoming release of our um, report on inheritance taxation in the OECD. The report is going to cover 36 OECD countries, including 24 uh, that currently have an inheritance or an estate tax. The goal of the report is first to uh, assess whether there's a case for making greater use of inheritance taxation in OECD countries. And second, um, to examine how OECD countries currently tax gifts and inheritances and how um, the design and the implementation of these taxes could be improved. So concluding with some policy recommendations. As I was saying, the release is planned for uh, May, 
So uh, hopefully some of you will be following that. Uh, and I'll just conclude by um, um, saying that this project has been financially supported by the Korea Institute of Public Finance. And uh, with that, I hand over to Sophie. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, for this section, and we could go to the next slide, uh, Stuart and I will update you on the OECD responses to uh, trans uh, tax treaties and transfer pricing interpretation issue arising as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we saw a, an increased need for more tax certainty and the tax treatment of employees and enterprises engaged in teleworking arrangement from various jurisdictions. So uh, the OECD therefore worked with uh, countries that were also providing uh, the um, various guidance on those issues. And we produced a first set of guidance on tax treaties in April. But uh, the unprecedented uh, measures imposed or recommend by government, including travel restriction, have continued well beyond 2020. So the OECD with Working Party One uh, members in the inclusive framework setting, so we're talking over 130 uh, jurisdiction, we work together to provide a revised set of guidance to increase even more tax certainty and especially in anticipation of the upcoming filing season. So that guidance was issued uh, last uh, January. It's on our website. Uh, the guidance highlight um, uh, the interpretation of the tax treaty related to three broad categories. Uh, the first one is whether it, uh, home offices, for example, and other circumstances would create a permanent establishment for uh, the employer or enterprises. So, uh, for example, what you can find on our um, on our website and in the guidance is a conclusion that individual working from home uh, because of public health uh, measures imposed or recommended by governments would not create a P for uh, the employer. Uh, the second category is uh, more concern that relates to the change of residence of the individual or uh, companies. So again, more guidance there. Uh, the third category is uh, our concern about uh, the tax treatment of employment income. So the revised guidance uh, is on our uh, website. Uh, it's a useful tool for you, especially during uh, the upcoming filing season. And what's uh, particularly helpful is that it includes several links to uh, country-specific guidance. So, um, so on that, uh, let me now hand over to Stuart, who will update you on the COVID-19 transfer pricing guidance. Stuart. Thank you, Sophie, and hello to all. In addition to the guidance on tax treaties, the OECD has also published guidance on the transfer pricing implications of COVID-19. Uh, in December of last year. This guidance was developed in light of the, the uniqueness of the current economic conditions, which has led to practical challenges for taxpayers in applying and tax administrations in administering transfer pricing rules. The guidance was developed jointly by our OECD's Working Party 6 and the FTA MAP form. Notably, it was approved and represents a consensus view of the uh, then 137 members of the inclusive framework on BEPS. Now, in broad terms, the guidance clarifies and illustrates the practical application of the arm's length principle as articulated by the OECD transfer pricing guidelines to some of the unique uh, fact patterns and challenges uh, implied by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's comprised of four chapters, each one dedicated to one of the main priority issues that were identified uh, with consultation with business as well as our inclusive framework delegates as part of the initial scoping phase of the project. Chapter one provides guidance on the comparability analysis. Now it's here, it's here that it's, it's true that the availability of party information is to the heart, the core, the application of transfer price rules. And while COVID-19 has certainly exacerbated the limitations of available data, this chapter provides um, 
some pragmatic approaches to address information deficiencies. Now, it's also true that many businesses have been hard hit by the pandemic and maybe making losses throughout their value chains. Chapter two of the guidance provides uh, guidance on the allocation of such losses as well as COVID-19 specific costs. Chapter three of the guidance is on government assistance programs. Now here we know that the pandemic has led to an unprecedented increase in, in, in government assistance. This, this chapter provides some guidance on some of the factors that should be evaluated to determine whether receiving government assistance may affect transfer prices. Finally, the last priority area laid out in guidance, it, is, uh, it covers advanced pricing agreements, which remain as one of the key instruments to enhance, to enhance tax certainty regarding transfer pricing. So it's in this spirit that the chapter encourages taxpayers and tax administrations to adopt a flexible and collaborative approach given the current economic conditions. So to sum up, and a real key takeaway here is, is the guidance affirms that the OECD transfer pricing guidelines can be applied in both good and bad economic times. Uh, it provides some pragmatic approaches and some solutions to some of the challenges implied by the pandemic. And finally, before I turn over to Akim uh, to provide an update on BEPS implementation and tax transparency, I'd just like to congratulate my colleagues in the Transfer Pricing Unit, Working Party 6, and the FTA MAP Forum for the very timely delivery and publication of this important guidance. You know, it really is a remarkable achievement in such a short period of time. Over to you, Akim. <clears throat> Thank you, Stuart. So let me walk you briefly through BEPS implementation, tracks transparency, and a couple of other relevant um, developments. First, just a single slide on BEPS implementation. There's a lot that we could say, we can't say given the time, but just running through the minimum standards, the four minimum standards, there's other actions, as you know, we'll, we can talk about them at another time. Um, action 5, Action 6, Action 13, and Action 14, and just give you a, a sense very briefly on, on where some of this stands. Action 5, moving forward, about 300 tax regimes reviewed. So virtually all harmful regimes have either been amended or abolished. There's a second leg to the harmful tax practices work on transparency, so we're moving forward with a review on the rulings. We've just released um, the new basis on which that will be performed. So. Um, moving forward on five, action six, countering treaty abuse. As you can see, 95 jurisdictions have now signed and 63 have ratified the MLI. If you translate this, this will ultimately result so far in 1700 treaties when the ratifications come through, um, which also means that with a large number of treaties, we will have stopped uh, treaty abuse. Action 13, um, ongoing work here, 90 jurisdictions have implemented, so practically every m and &E that was meant to be in scope of the CDC reporting is in scope. It is not only being in scope, it is also exchanging over 2,700 exchange relationships. So the information is with the tax administrations that need them to do high-level risk assessment. At the same time, we have committed and we are undertaking a review of the standard itself, and we hope to be able to get that out and agreed on the remaining issues later in the year. So stay tuned for uh, the outcomes of the 2020 review. Then moving to action 14, improving dispute resolution. You may have tuned in for the tax certainty day and other updates or the public consultation, in fact, that we just had on the action 14 review. That's also something that we are reviewing. Change is happening, we can see it, taxpayers are seeing it in the way that the MAP function operates. Um, we have 80 jurisdictions that have been reviewed with about 1800 recommendations that have been made. We are following them up. If you break it down, there's about 1100, 1150 or so that relate to inadequate treaty networks that are being approved. 600 relate to other aspects. And also importantly, there's another 400 that are recommendations of continue the good work because competent authorities are often pulling out the stops, trying to get together, using new approaches to resolve, hopefully, not just hopefully, but removing more quickly uh, the map cases as they come in. So this gives you a sense of where we are across the minimum standards. Then let me move to uh, the next slide, uh, just to spotlight briefly on one of the important programs that we have on the tax administration side, moving from BEPS to tax administration. The future of transfer pricing, here we go, it's ICAP, a program uh, that has now gone from a pilot into a program. It's a program of a multilateral risk assurance 
process around transfer pricing and uh, PE. Many of you know it. Several of you listening may have gone through and have participated in the earlier pilot programs. Thank you to the tax administration. Thank you to the taxpayer that have helped us to develop this. And of course, we have taken ideas also out of the ICAP into some of the work that we're doing in pillar one, thinking about the future of tax certainty and how we can be, and I guess that's where we all want to be in the prevention space rather than the resolution space. Um, the, given the time, I won't have the time to go into the details of where we stand, just a couple of headlight pieces of information on ICAP. We have just released the handbook and the program details. They're out now, they're on our website. So you can read up about how the program is going to work. Um, we will shortly be publishing the list of participating tax administration, and we would expect and hope that all of those that have been in the pilot will be in the program and potentially more. So we will soon be publishing which tax administration are in it. It's open to all members of the Forum on Tax Administration, OECD, G20, and a number of other countries around the world. The um, application deadline will be the 30th of September sometime. We have briefing sessions that we're planning for interested uh, taxpayers to find out more, how it works, what it might mean. Um, we can put out details, but they will be on the 30th of March and the 1st of April, so we can uh, cater to different time zones. And then finally, if you're interested, very important that you contact the headquarter tax administration early in the process to discuss participation. A very important program uh, that does provide de facto tax certainty in uh, very demanding and ambitious timelines, I think. And then last, and that's the last slide, a yet different topic, moving to crypto assets. Um, first, um, talking about a piece of work that David's side of the house has done. So very quickly on the tax treatment, we released a report on taxing virtual currencies. Uh, recently, it's the first comprehensive analysis of existing approaches and key policy gaps across the main categories of taxes. How do we deal with the taxation? How do we tax it? What is the tax treatment of crypto assets? And then over on our side of the house, I'm seeing David to the left of mine, so it's moving into the tax transparency space, so it comes over into my little box here, um, where we are now thinking about what is the most appropriate way to make sure that we don't have black holes in the reporting to the extent there are gains that are being generated in the disposition holding, otherwise disposition of uh, crypto assets. And so we are in active discussions on how this can be done. This is going through the appropriate working parties right now. Um, it is a key feature that will need to be integrated into our reporting infrastructure also to ensure a level playing field. The work is progressing of including crypto assets in the scope of the CRS or a similar reporting and exchange framework um, that brings together all the major players around the world. This is a global enterprise and in order to be sure that we are being transparent, we need to reach out to all the major players and engage with them and have them come together so that we have tax transparency also in this emerging space of crypto assets. Um, and with this, I think I come to the end and I hand over to Grace. Thank you, Joachim, and good afternoon. Uh, good evening, good morning, everyone. Um, as Pascal said, last week we published a report that recommends actions that governments can take to address the risks posed by professional and enablers uh, involved in the aiding and abetting of tax crimes and other financial crimes. The report is full of real life cases submitted by our delegates on how professional enablers facilitate these tax crimes. Now, who are the professional enablers that are being targeted by this report? Well, as I said, we are talking about those who are aiding and abetting the commission of tax crimes and other financial crimes which is illegal in the majority of countries. Professional enablers are skilled professionals who use this specialized knowledge to facilitate the commission of tax and other economic crimes by their clients, usually in large scale and through sophisticated means. They can include lawyers, accountants, notaries, financial institutions, trust and corporate service providers, but they can also include in the crypto asset environment operators of black markets on the dark web. These marketplaces enable criminals to buy and sell contraband such as stolen goods, drugs, and weapons. Um, and because the operation of these marketplaces require a very high degree of technical expertise, 
the operators of these services can be characterized as professional enablers of criminal activities, including financial crime. Dark web marketplaces use crypto assets as the primary payment method for transactions to exploit the enhanced anonymity and the ability to facilitate transactions that circumvent safeguards within the traditional regulated financial system. So the report highlights that the majority of professionals are law abiding and play an important role in assisting businesses and individuals to understand and comply with the laws and helping the financial system run smoothly. The report does not deal with those professionals who exploit the gray areas of the law, which is not technically illegal and is being addressed through various other areas of our work, notably the BEPS project, but also a lot of the FTA's work, including the 2008 study into the role of tax intermediaries, which really laid the foundations for a lot of the cooperative compliance initiatives we see today. So now if we look at the next slide, how do professional enablers facilitate tax crimes? And here you see some of the most common ways they set up companies, trusts, or offshore businesses. And well, that's a lot of what a lot of lawyers and accountants may do. But here, what we're talking about is setting up these companies, et cetera, to obscure beneficial ownership, to hide clients' money and its sources from tax and other authorities. In addition, what they do is they engage in falsifying documentation for clients to evade taxation and facilitate um, illegal tax schemes. So if we look at the next slide, what are the OECD's recommendations to countries to address uh, this issue? Well, the OECD recommends a multi-pronged approach focusing on five areas, which you see on the slide. We have um, first raising skills and awareness among the tax crime investigators to ensure that they are well equipped to identify the types of professional enablers operating in their jurisdiction and to understand the risks posed by the ways that professional enablers devise, market, implement, and conceal tax crimes and other financial crimes. Second, effective legislation. Ensure that the law provides investigators and prosecutors with sufficient authority to identify, prosecute, and sanction professional enablers so as to deter and penalize them. Without this, there's no real point in pursuing them. This could include a consideration of whether there is a need for a specific professional enabler liability regime to further deter this behavior. And they could also explore whether professional supervisory or regulatory bodies can be used to stop professional enablers from operating. Third, deterrence and disruption are critical. And here what uh, governments need to do is to ensure a coherent and multidisciplinary strategy involving communication, leveraging the role of supervisory bodies, incentivizing early disclosure, whistleblowing, and taking a strong approach to enforcement in practice. Fourth, cooperation, both at national and international level. And then fifth, effective implementation. And here, what is suggested is that countries appoint a lead per person or agency to oversee the implementation of the professional enabler strategy so that um, there is implementation and follow-up to see how it can be improved. So find out more about this work. We will be having a, a session on the 24th of March um, at the Global uh, Integrity Forum that the OECD hosts every year. Let me now turn it over to Pascal. Thank you, Grace. Uh, I think we are just on schedule. Uh, forthcoming um, is a, a very busy uh, schedule ahead of us uh, with the deliverables for the G20. I mentioned them at the opening of these tax talks. Uh, it's about digital and that is the utmost priority. So all our efforts will be about making sure that we have an agreed um, solution on pillar one and pillar two, uh, together with a standstill and rollback of unilateral measures 
in July, but also ensuring the uh, work stream that the, the different work streams we have uh, on BEPS, on exchange of information. We didn't mention today the uh, global forum work on peer reviewing automatic exchange of information, but that's something key. We didn't mention today the work uh, with developing countries, uh, but that's uh, extremely important. We didn't mention tax inspectors without borders, but I can tell you a lot is currently going on extractive industries in particular, and there may be some uh, very interesting takeaways. We haven't mentioned tax administration, but there was a report adopted by the uh, plenary of the uh, Forum on Tax Administration about Administration 3.0 on how we can support tax administrations. We've put the emphasis on uh, the tax policy work on uh, the tax policy at the time of COVID, the taxation of capital income, capital ownership, which I think is something which is structuring the political or the policy, the tax policy debate in uh, many countries. Uh, we've talked, of course, about uh, the uh, tax and environment. So you can see that we have a wide uh, um, uh, range of topics which are going on, uh, even though the emphasis uh, and the priority will be in the coming weeks and the coming months on digital. Uh, Zahim um, uh, sketched it out. We think that uh, indeed uh, the blueprints are a solid basis for an agreement, even though we recognize the complexity of Pillar 1, especially as it reflects so many different positions. Now that there is a new dynamic for a negotiation, I think much more simplifications will be able to come in. Um, um, same on, on Pilot 2, even though on Pilot 2 is more about the implementation that we, we have the challenge. So a lot, uh, stay tuned uh, and uh, we'll be happy to brief you regularly uh, so that uh, you know what's uh, going on on the international tax front. On that note, I will conclude uh, and uh, invite you to ask questions. We have five to 10 minutes left uh, and we'll be happy to take questions. Uh, as uh, Hazel indicated to you, you can send your questions through the Q&A uh, functions. Uh, and uh, I would like um, to uh, turn to the questions we did receive before uh, the uh, tax talk started. Um, one question which um, is for, I mean, Arim or, or myself, but I turn to Arim. Um, one, of, uh, uh, one person in the audience says, well, P2 seems to be more advanced than P1. Uh, will they be decoupled? So what, what do you think of this, both on the technical aspect and the, and the political aspect? The important part is to unmute myself. <laughs> Um, these are traveling as a package. Um, um, we have not coordinated our response with Pascal, but so that's where I see pillar one and pillar two are traveling as a package also in the political process. It may well be true that there are certain aspects of pillar two um, that are more developed in technical detail. Nevertheless, I think as they stay together here, they will be traveling together towards July is at least my sentiment. Thank you. Thank you, Arim. I can also confirm that what we hear from ministers of the G20, and, and you may have also uh, listened in our um, inclusive framework at the end of January, where we had a panel of six ministers, uh, they were uh, largely, uh, I mean, they were converging on the fact uh, that uh, they were expecting a solution and both pillars were coming together. Uh, one question on, on uh, mid-market companies, SMEs, uh, the turnover of which being below 500 million, uh, without uh, preempting the discussion on the thresholds, which is going on, uh, and, and we also need to see you understood to talk about the scope, but but would these companies, these SMEs be, be impacted by, by Pillar 1 and possibly Pillar 2, Arim? Again, crystal ball, as Pascal says, the discussion on the thresholds are not final because the pillars aren't final and until there's an agreement on everything, there is no agreement. Having said that, the expectation is that SMEs, uh, I think, would, would not be affected by um, these pillars. 
and so probably no, but specific threshold remain to be agreed. Thank you, Arim. A question for a change to David. Uh, what tax policies recommended during the pandemic? Uh, what are we recommending? And maybe I should say, because it's a bit counterintuitive, but even we tax people at the OECD, we say, don't raise your taxes to pay for COVID. You need to make sure that uh, the increase of the debt will be sustainable by fostering growth, uh, by favoring investments, by having your own policy, but tax is not the response. However, building back better includes better tax policies. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Pascal. That's exactly right, that now is not the time for countries to be increasing taxes. Uh, we think it's important that um, in the emergency phase, which for many countries, uh, we have been there or have been returning there, depending on the, the waves as they've come and gone. It's important to, to focus on ensuring that um, what you're doing in your tax system is supporting businesses and supporting households and not undermining the health response. That's an important element of, uh, of the approach that should be taken. Then, of course, there's the recovery. And uh, many economies have sought to, to balance the emergency response with uh, a partial economic recovery um, in the hope that as the vaccines arrive, that the, the prospect of being able to move to a more normal um, economy as we once knew it, um, and at that point pursue recovery. Now, through this period, we see many countries implementing the sorts of measures uh, that we've seen in other economic downturns in the past. Although it's important to recognise that this is a little bit different in the sense that we still have the, the challenge of managing the pandemic and, and not necessarily wanting to encourage some of the forms of economic activity that we have in the past seen, for example, consumption in restaurants, for example, if you're locking down uh, those sectors of the economy, it's difficult to do anything there. What we would say is that the decisions that you take today to support economic recovery in the short term, uh, they should not be inconsistent with your health policy response, and nor should they be inconsistent with what might be the longer term policy responses needed once we move beyond the crisis. So in that context, we would say um, it, it's a challenging environment, but as I mentioned earlier, this crisis does present an opportunity when hopefully we're able to navigate it and work our way uh, through the worst aspects of it, that we can then begin to have a more fundamental discussion about whether or not our tax systems continue to be fit for purpose for delivering on our economic, social object objectives as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, David. We have a question uh, asking us to clarify the uh, German finance minister of finance position on something. I, I have to say, Mindy, that we don't clarify the German finance minister's comments. Uh, ask the German finance ministers or his team. Uh, we are the secretariat and we cannot speak on behalf of our members. So sorry, that's a good question, but I unfortunately cannot uh, uh, respond uh, to it. There, there is a question on uh, the uh, current timing envisaged to implement pillar one and pillar two. That, that's a very good question, which will be part of the negotiation, part of the discussion. Uh, I, I'm, I don't have the answer today. What, what I sense, but that's speculation and, and that's, commit, that, that, that's committing me on me. Uh, but we have a sense that uh, there is a new dynamic and if there is an agreement, we're not yet there. I mean, we, we, we have a number of obstacles to overcome to make sure that there is an agreement, but the, the stars are aligned uh, and the conditions probably gathered. So it's uh, for us collectively, the 139 countries and the secretary to make sure that we can get there. If there is an agreement, my sense is that there will be a wish to move fast, to move fast to withdraw the unilateral measures, to move to the unilateral solution. It will require domestic changes, uh, domestic law changes uh, on the one hand, probably some form of international instruments, multilateral instruments, changes to bilateral instruments to be explored. So it will take some time, but my sense is that uh, countries will be willing uh, to move uh, quite uh, fast uh, there. Uh, I see that we have many, many questions coming in. 
uh, and we just don't have the time to go through them. Um, it's uh, one minute before the end, and uh, the time to read the questions uh, will, uh, will, will not uh, uh, be able to, to provide a response. Um, when will you, maybe for the last question, when will you see drafts? Um, and there again, uh, we're fully transparent. We don't know. It depends on how the negotiation uh, goes, uh, whether there will be time to go for another round of public consultation. And I doubt it, seriously. I think that we now have all the 10 components of Pillar 1, which have been uh, put to the public, largely commented. We received thousands of pages of comments. So uh, I think that uh, thanks to your comments, uh, we will be able to uh, um, um, bring responses, uh, which will uh, help uh, build consensus. So I think that the next time you see uh, documents uh, will be the uh, agreement, if there is an agreement. Uh, at the inclusive framework meeting and in the run-up to the G20. If there is an agreement, will be a political agreement, there may be some more granular, and I think there will be some more granular elements there, but there will be further time, I think, uh, to move to the legal instruments, and, and that's where probably uh, further consultations will take place. But still, in spite of, of this timeline being very short, we don't know yet, uh, stay tuned. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's 5 p.m. in France right now, so uh, we've come to the end of these tax talks. I would like to thank the team, not only for participating to tax talks, but uh, uh, for doing the uh, pretty impressive work. Uh, I can tell you that delivering on all this requires uh, a, a great deal of work. We would like to thank. Uh, our delegates uh, who work uh, and are indefatigable, indefatigable in, in, in working uh, on our topics and, and invite you to look at these new work streams which are emerging, uh, which may be less in the scope of the work of the uh, uh, 1200 participants today in our tax talks, but uh, which I think will be important with, with international tax law consequences one way or another. On that note, uh, thank you all for listening in and um, stay tuned. We'll get back to you soon, I think. Thank you.